Hello, all you hardcores out there. How are you doing? It's Big P here, the biggest gob in sport. Now, right, today I'm joined by Kent. You may have met him before or seen him before on here. Women love him, men want to be him. <laughs> How are you doing, Kent? Good morning, Russell. How's it going? All right, I get loads of emails from all your lady followers, Kent. Fan club? Well, I don't get any. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Where'd you get the glasses from, Kent? Rick Top. They're my old they're they're my old glasses. I've got a new set coming this week. So I thought thought Rick Top would lend you a more Ronnie Cray. Yeah, there's actually a photograph of online. There's actually a photograph of Reggie and Ronnie. I think Ronnie's wearing them. And I'm like, yeah, I like those glasses. They're more 60s, 60s style, more retro style. Good man, good man. Uh I've been away, Kent, in sunny Spain for a week, working my ass off. Uh, what's been going on in the sport of boxing? Well, where do you want me to start? Start where you want, Kent. What did you think, Russell? I'm just getting sick of media and boxing. No. Uh, I'm sick of media and boxing just saying what, what they think, not what they think. Just, just on educated approach to boxing. You know, you you look back, the years gone through. You had the likes of, you know, some a lot of really good boxing journalists through the years, and now you know, Sam and Jordan seems to be the the mouthpiece of of boxing journalism now. And does what what does he actually know about boxing, Russell? Uh, well, I think first of all, Simon Jordan's a boxing fan, isn't it? We have to get we have to give. We have to give him that. He's a fan. Uh, second, he's he were known in the football industry as uh, pretty stand upish against. So he stood up, didn't he, against player power and uh, football agents, things like that. And he, he's known for doing the right thing, I suppose. And so for him to be critical on boxing, even though he's not a fighter. And, Never worked in the boxing industry. He, I think people probably listen to him, don't they? He's been a hard-nosed businessman. My friend used to work in one of his phone shops, you know, many, many years ago. And he he, uh, he started with, I heard, a small loan off his dad and turned it into a 50 million quid company, didn't he? And obviously then he, had, he had fell, fell on tough times, didn't he? But from what I've heard, he's not in poor house. But I kind of like him. I like Simon. Joe. I like what he stands for. But... Uh, no, he hasn't been a boxer or a manager or a trainer or a promoter, has he? Yeah, I, I do like him, like yourself. I like I like his story. I thought he was brilliant in football. I remember him in, in Crystal Palace, and I thought he was just a, a great character, Crystal Palace. Yeah. His football chat uh, is, is absolutely brilliant with Danny Murphy and Jim. I, I love it. I really, really enjoy it. But he, it just frustrates me sometimes when he says things like, he said the other day there that Ricky Hatton's win against Costa Hugh in Manchester was the best performance by a British fighter. You know, and I'm thinking, what about John John H. Stracy away? Uh, you look at Lloyd Honigan. Things like that just annoy me, to be honest with you. You even go back and you look at you look at Kirkland Lang, went and beat Roberto Duran and, and, and the Garden, you know, things, they're really, really super. I don't think it was the Garden, I think it was Detroit. Detroit, yeah, it was, sorry, corrected. Uh, and Detroit, so, you know, they're really, really great, great boxing performances from British fighters. But at that time, you know, when, when Hatton fought Costa Zhu, he hadn't fought in near three years, two years at least. And his last fight before that was against another fighter who had hardly been fighting was Jesse James Leha. Yeah, so but did, didn't he do Zeb Judah though before Hatton or not long before Hatton or one of his was way, It was way before Hatton. So way, it was way before. Okay. Okay. Uh, Costa Zoo, I felt was spent at the time, and I thought it was great matchmaking by Bricktop because he were not weighing and had been inactive, and he was showing signs of a bit wear and tear. Ricky Atom were coming through and that pressure style, it made Costa Zoo fight for every minute of every round in until the quitting end. But technique wise, Mickey Atom had a mating technique wise. That was a pressure fighter. And when he stepped up against somebody who were elite, 
when he got put to kick, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, that, that style, Ricky Hatton style, really, really would have suited the, the Costa Zoo style. You know, there were two, Costa Zoo had more of a European upright style, big puncher with a backhand, but yeah. he, he hadn't had that activity, you know, get into it. But yeah, I think there's better wins there. I think Lloyd Honigan's win away to Donald Curry, the Cobra, was probably one of the best ever, as again, John H. Tracy you know, going away and winning the world title. You look at Tommy Farr, who who went the distance yeah. with the great Joe Lewis at that time. But I, I do like talk sport. I think what they've done is they're, they're kind of given more publicity, the boxing. It's a, it's a different voice, the boxing, on a big platform. But I just don't like sometimes when they come off with, with silly things like that. There. It's kind of like they're coming off with things that hasn't been researched. And yeah. it kind of it kind of makes it not look look as good as it maybe should be if that makes sense because they're doing all that other stuff and you say something stupid like that it just it doesn't make it as authentic if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, do you feel Kent that uh, the people who work at Talks for the ones that are you know uh, the guard and, and jug ears, uh, do you feel that since people on social media set about them for the bias I put that in a in a professional manner instead of what usual uh, filth that comes out of my mouth do you feel that their bias was that bad that they probably had a man in the mirror moment like what Julian always talks about the man in the mirror moment and you feel that they've tried to tidy their sense up a little bit massively Massively, I've I've noticed it probably. I was actually thinking that the other day. I was looking for my own notes, and I was looking through it the other day, and I just like jot stuff down through the week, and I just can't believe the vocabulary of Spencer Oliver now. He he just doesn't really seem to care. Uh, he just has a thing for Eddie Hearn. He's been setting about Eddie Hearn, and if that's his opinions, and and that's what he feels, and especially with the whole Conor Ben situation, you know, Spencer Oliver in his own right was an absolutely brilliant fighter. And if you want to go back and watch a great Spencer Oliver fight, I've said this in the channel, go back and watch him against uh, Patrick Mullins for the area title. Class fight. But there's someone whose career was cut short with, with a serious injury. And the way he's been talking this last couple of weeks you know, you can feel the passion in him. You can you can see that, that he's actually being honest. It's 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 it, he's not afraid to have an opinion. I think Gareth A. Davis is the same. I think I think he's I'm not saying he's got lots and lots and lots of credibility because you know he's a massive Tyson Fury, you know, propaganda machine, but he has been a lot more credible. This last couple of months, especially in, in the, the whole Conor Ben thing, he, he's been kind of at the forefront of, of calling it out and asking questions. And I think that's what boxing needs at the minute. I think we need to have more of a, a voice, more of a voice asking the boxing, you know, fraternity what is actually going on, especially with issues like the board, drug tests, alleged drug tests, adverse findings. Cards, mandatories, pay per views. That's that's the questions that fans want to hear and that they need answered. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that? This. Do you feel that because we've for the last 10, 12 years in the Eddie Hills era or Edward Hearn era? Eduardo. Eduardo Hills. Do you feel that in the Eduardo Hills era, that they got away with that much at Sky because they were controlling the narratives of Sky on social media with big platforms and all these casuals and all that. The only way is Essex lot putting stuff out constantly. And at one point, I remember Eddie Hearn saying, I invite all that Essex, the only way is Essex, to these shows as my guests because they've got 70 odd million subscribers across all platforms. So he would, he would innovate. He knew what he would do it, but do you feel that because they got away with it for that long that the guard and juggiers, when they got to talk sport, they thought they could do the same thing. 
I think it's. I think there's two two ways you look at it. Uh, the whole thing with Sky at the time, you know, when Barney Francis had a a, a foothold of it, he left. Eddie kind of took over that mantle. Can I just point out where he went to work? You do know where he went to work, don't you? He works at Matchroom. You know that, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So that was all nice and cosy, wasn't it? Yeah, it was all. Was like, all it's just nice. like it's just like yeah. Bean. Bean taking up a job at, at Matchroom <laughs> doing the darts. What's he know about darts, him? <laughs> he ain't got a beer belly. No, no. I think yeah. But but you go back and and what we were saying there. At the time, Spencer was on Sky quite a lot, a lot. He's he was on Sky. I think he was on Sky from after he retired right through to when Eddie took over that that single that deal, you know that that deal where it was exclusively Matchroom. Then he was probably bumped out to bring the likes of Darren Barker and all in and, and Tony Bellew. So he's probably got a, a bit of a you know, a grievance there is like, well, you know what? I worked there for years. You've come in. I'm not there no more. And this is his way of kind of like payback. Uh, Gareth A. Davis. I think Gareth A. Davis, he's had a lot of stick this last year or so, rightly so. But I think, I think Gareth A. Davis is actually a boxing fan. Yeah. I think he actually likes boxing. And now he's on talk sport. He's got that voice to say, Anything, he he he's basically, he, you don't hear him being as critical against Frank and and uh, Queensbury, but he's very vocal and very verbal against Matchroom. Well, he, he's on top well he wasn't, was he? Before he got that job there and got him with uh, the Gypsy King, was he? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, he's he's that he's that propaganda machine for 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 Tyson Fury. Do you feel, Kent, that? Uh... Where people like the guard and Adam Smith, well, let's have it right, he had his knuckles wrapped at Sky for getting too close to Inkle Pythons years ago, wanting to be everybody's pal, especially now and and and, uh, and whatnot. But do you feel that they should just stay as journalists and not get too close to Pythons? Because when it comes to doing their job, what all we see is, I'll use that word again, bias, but that's an underrated word with this lot. But... Do you feel that, Ken? Yeah, it's it's really hard now to be be a boxing journalist and and be a journalist and be objective in sport. Uh, you look way back when, when Colin Hart, you know, was at 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 the Sun and, and and various other outlets, and you could you could go on and say, well, that wasn't great, that wasn't good, that was good, and you would have been invited back. Now, it's all about viewership. It's all about getting access. And I suppose now that it's kind of like what you talked about there in, in football. It's like player power and, and football. It, it's like it's like agents in football now basically control it. You know, if you're not going to get access, you're not going to have a job. So they have to keep that. They need to protect their their livelihood and, and not be, yeah. you know, so critical where, where us, we don't get access. We just come on and talk as fans. It's it's not our job. We're we're fans of boxing. Yeah. But with them and it's 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 a bit it's a bit different. Yeah, it's uh I can explain it. Yeah, it's just bias, isn't it? And um, the fact that they've they've tidied it up. People like me you know, haven't been told I've got to tidy my uh, my uh, uh, filthy mouth up. <laughs> Well, you haven't said a bad any bad language in the last twenty nine videos, so there you go. Uh, what well, I didn't know that, Ken, but well done. Uh, well, what can you do? But no, I, I think they know that it were getting out of control with what they were saying to Joshua after the fight, and just come on, Spencer Oliver were a world world ranked fighter, and if he hadn't got injured, he were he were nailed on to be a world champion, wasn't it? So to carry off like that, it's uh, just embarrassing. I think. I, I think. I think what happened with Spencer was he 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 got so far up the rabbit hole of of Anthony Joshua, or so far down the rabbit hole with Anthony Joshua, 
and he had that interview with, with, with Simon Jordan. And to be honest with you, if you go back and watch it, I was actually away that week and, and work and I, I couldn't really see any videos. And I think I, I seen one video that week and it was the Spencer Oliver and Simon Jordan. And he just called him out and he tore him to pieces. Like he, Simon actually tore him to pieces. And I think from that video, and I think he's watched it back and he's actually says, you know what? Simon's actually right here. And I think from, from that whole incident, I think his language and his vocabulary has has totally changed. Totally are, changed. Are we going to give Joe Gears the benefit of the doubt then until he steps out of line again? Well, we, we can't really say. Like he, he's been very vocal this last couple of weeks. When was that? When when was that adverse finding? Uh, yeah, well, that, that, that probably saved his job actually because he had to he had to go the uh, he had to go against the the. Eddie and Ben and all that lot, didn't it? So, and that probably with him making his outbursts on that, it, it probably deflected his bias with Joshua. Do you think? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And what about uh, the Gad? Where 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 does where's he ranking with fans at the moment? Can you 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 you're more on ball with that social media game than me. I just if I've got to say, I say it in front of that. That's it. But you're you're more you you see more on, online than I see. What what what's the Gad's reputation like online? Is it still tarnished, or is he repairing it? He he still gets he would still get a lot of stick, but but I think people are actually just saying now, you know, with the whole with the last month of boxing. Well, he still thinks that that he still thinks that Chisora. And, and Fury is a good fight. He turned around and he said that Chisora is improving. He's beat P- Pulev. He's a puncher. Then I thought he, I goes, thought he lost against Pulev, mate. Th- then he goes and he, he, he's just hypercritical of the board. He's hypercritical of that whole fiasco with, with, with Conor Ben and uh, Chris Eubank Jr., so I can't say he he's fully he, he's fu, fu, fully uh, cleaned up his act because he said that, but he also it's like it's like a seesaw. It's he's kind of like a seesaw a, a fact at the minute with, with okay, Gary Davis. Okay, then, Ken. Okay, well, well, how come the guard is not mentioning the fact that Tyson Fury fought Christian Hammer, and he was supposed to have been. Uh, under investigation for uh, for his first drugs fail, you want it? The gad never mentions that, does he? Never, never. So, okay then. Well, well, let's let's park them up because they're, they're trying to sort themselves out. They know they've done wrong, and they probably got they probably got that much stick off people that, like I just said, there they've had a man in the middle moment. But I look at the gad like this: he's the broadsheet writer, isn't he? Yeah, Telegraph or Mail, one of them in it. Yeah, Telegraph. Mail, yeah. Mail, mail, which is the Daily Mail. I thought it was Telegraph. Was that bunch of Telegraph? Well, he's he's a broadsheet writer, whatever you want to call it. Newspapers, nobody cares about them. That's why he's had to piggyback into this. That's how I. That's yeah. how I look at it. And it's not for me to say what 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 he's like on his personal life, but when he's doing that, we having the bridges on Zoom, and I, I bet we all hear things this and that, and. You know, he might just get excited hanging around boxing people. I don't know. I've heard he's like a child at after parties, like a giddy kid. So I don't know, but I wouldn't like to think that he were going on a date with my daughter, even if we were the same age as her, and she's 10. So in 10 years, she were 20 and he were 20. I'd be unhappy if she fetched him home. The, the, oh. way, the way I see it, Russell, is that they have known that there have been propaganda machines for their own. Well, they are. They're tidying up things for people. Look, and, Coogan Cassius, let's part the gad up because he, he does me not in him at the time. Coogan, let's move on to Coogan, right. Coogan's the cleaner, isn't it? He? He's the clean-up man. Do you know that film with Bridget Fonda, the assassin or whatever it's called? There's a guy in it called the cleaner, isn't it? Harvey Keitel plays him, doesn't it? When all happens, they ring the cleaner, don't they? That's Coogan. He's the cleaner, isn't he? Yeah, he 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 
he's in a, that he's in that predicament again where he can't be he needs access he needs access from Matrim he needs Matra, Ma, he needs access from Queensbury so he kind of has to be in the middle uh I think he gets a lot of stick a lot of times on there's kind of things that he, he he can say and what he can't say and if he does say things he's not going to get access and that's going to affect that's going to affect his 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 business and you kind of can't fault them for that, really, can you? Because no, you can't. So you can't. I remember years ago, Dennis saying to me, "He's destined for big things." And I started you know, all that, Dennis. He said, oh, "People in, you know, different TV platforms, ITV, Sky, other other networks were saying he's destined for big things." But he hung around boxing for too long, Coogan, in my opinion, and became too familiar and too friendly with certain people. I mean, let's look at Coogan, who he said on social media is close friends in boxing. Joshua, Eddie Hearn, Dave Allen, Dylan White, Conor Ben. Am I right? Yeah. He said that. Now, all them people who are his best friends in boxing and who he trusts and this and that, all do views and they all do IFL and they all do views. I don't hear him saying... Tommy Frank at Sheffield's his pal, or, or whoever, Joe Blow, or Fred Startemotor. I don't hear any of that. All I hear is people who do views, and my friends. And that, to me, is something that's money orientated. What I think is he's, 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 he's made a rod for his own back there because he hung around that long and befriended that many people. He got to a stage where when you go into the houses, or a cuppa and a penguin biscuit and a chat and seeing them at after parties and having a drink with him, going out for meals, this and that, blah de blah. You get to a stage where you can't say no about them. And I felt like that with Dennis at the time. And I thought, I'm going to be all right here if I've got to say something about this. I remember going to one of Dennis's shows and him saying, Hey, I brought your camera. And I'm saying, I've been at it all day. I don't want to be here filming at night. I, you know, I like to have a night out when I go out. But the reason I didn't take the camera is I thought, oh, they were pulling out left, right and centre. And they were the first show that Kevin and the ones this came to one of Dennis's shows and there were three fights on it. And it were on the telly. Three fights and there were massive gaps in between. So tea time, I'm thinking, I'm oh, going to be all right here taking my camera here. What am I going to be able to say about this? So I thought, I'll just swerve it. And then after that, I thought, oh, kicking me, Sam. I thought, I should have really took it, but I wanted a night out. But after that, I went full steam ahead on anything. Because that, that's what I was like. And I said, well, well, that's crap, that's crap, he's crap. He should be in with him. And I went back into Pokemon. But that was just to get everybody's attention. It's hard to look for positives when you're at a show when you've got people doing move-arounds, turning up to lose. And really, they can beat the kids that didn't win. How can I say all positive about it? So now I've just got to go in flow, haven't I? It's very, very hard. But his problem were, he's get Eddie Earn every now and then he messes up and he goes on IFL to correct it. And he don't go after him. Well, I can't, can I? Well, what are you interviewing him for anyway? If he's paying you, he was paying him for years, money, whatever, a week, and expense cards and all that. He's probably when he was telling everybody. So how can you have a go at someone when they're doing that? Dennis didn't pay me. We did other things together, but I never took out at boxing. What, 10 VIP tickets to show? Yeah, bring all your pals. I couldn't give the tickets away. See where I'm coming from? Yeah. So I feel I can say what I want when they're not paying me. But if they were paying me, I would still say something anyway. You've got to be true to what you believe in. They believe in money down there. That's it. Trust me, I've met a six people. All they're interested in money. They're not worried about all oh, else, money. He's let his send down because he's a good interviewer, Coogan. Very good, very patient in front of the camera. But, no, I don't know. Anyway, let's, uh, let's go on to uh, Link 2, Ken, and uh, we'll try and be a bit more positive. And uh, it saved me getting told off. Oh, 